We've, uh, we've long struggled with having uh, a, a someone with an expertise in transplant infectious disease. As you can imagine, that's a big issue in post-transplant care. Um, Alyssa completed her uh, fellowship in uh, transplant ID uh, in uh, Boston at Mass General Hospital. Uh, and came back apparently a year ago today uh, to be on staff. She's got a joint appointment at both VGH uh, and St. Paul's. She's uh, an ass a clinical assistant professor of medicine with the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases um, and obviously has a very important presence in terms of management of our post-transplant patients, but also is very much involved uh, on the pre-transplant side in terms of not just recipients, but on the don deceased donation side, has done a lot of work with BC Transplant and laying out infectious disease protocols and management on those signs. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Alyssa to come talk to us about vaccinations. Thanks, Jag, for that very warm <laughs> introduction. So I'm going to spend about the next hour talking about vaccines. I do have some disclosures, none of which are relevant to this presentation. So the objectives of the next hour are to identify the appropriate vaccinations for patients in the pre-transplant setting and then discuss some of the challenges and limitations, um, particularly around uh, what happens after transplant and what happens if you miss vaccinations. So I'm going to start with a case, which is actually from here. So I got phoned one day about a 37-year-old guy who had had one MMR vaccine as a child. In May of 2013, he'd had measles serology done, and he was negative, seronegative, um, so no antibody detected. He had never been given an additional MMR vaccine unfortunately, and he went to transplant in October of 2013. So in February of 2015, the question was, can we go to Disneyland with my kids for vacation? And what you may or may not know or remember is the big hullabaloo about the measles outbreak in Disneyland. So um, I ended up saying, unfortunately, no, you should cancel your trip and plan to go somewhere else. And so I really think that um, it may seem silly, but vaccines are important and they're a great opportunity to provide protection to your patients. So I also like to put this up because if you never see a transplant patient for the rest of your life, um, vaccines are still important. So what this is is a graph of the crude death rate um, from infectious disease for the United States over the last century. And what someone has come, because as you will notice as you go along the graph, um, the death rates have significantly gone down, but someone has come along and put uh, the top 10 sort of public health interventions on there. And so you'll see things like first use of antibiotics, so penicillin, um, first vaccine introduced, and Vaccination Assistance Act. So out of reducing death, um, vaccines are one of the important public health. So it's important for everyone, not just transplant patients. Um, and so you probably all are aware that after transplant, patients are more susceptible to diseases, they get more infections, and often when they get the common infections, they have more severe manifestations of them. So, as I've already mentioned, um, if you can update their vaccines before they go to transplant, that is best. So which vaccines? Well, there's some um, that we can test for. So. Um, you know, we would normally say routine childhood immunization, and that can mean different things depending on where you are. So in general, when I'm talking about the routine vaccines for transplant, you want to think, think about things like hepatitis A and B, uh, MMR, varicella or chickenpox, and then very rarely you can actually test for some of the more... Um, uh, unusual things we don't test for. We normally just update things like tetanus, but you can get tetanus antibodies. Um, the other routine vaccines to think about are pneumococcus, flu vaccine, and tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. So I'm going to go one by one through um, uh, some of the routine vaccines. So influenza, it's a good time of year to remind everyone about this. It's just about time for your annual flu shot. So influenza is a seasonal viral infection. There are two strains, and usually there are two strains that circulate every season. So the major human subtypes are A and B. Um, and, and so your patient, because often multiple strains circulate in one flu season, can get two flu infections from one flu season. 
Um, influenza in solid organ transplant patients is associated with very severe outcomes. Uh, the ICU admission rate is about 16%, which is much higher than um, patients who are not immunocompromised. And the death rate is estimated from flu to be about 6%. Solid organ transplant patients are much more likely to get extra pulmonary complications, um, and they have prolonged viral shedding after they're infected, meaning um, often there is live virus for much longer than anyone else, and they can transmit it to other people. There is also this increased risk of graft rejection. So there are two influenza vaccines. There's inactivated influenza vaccine and the live attenuated influenza vaccine. The one that's the most common out there in the community is the inactivated influenza vaccine. It's trivalent, meaning it usually contains two strains of influenza A and one strain of influenza B. And then it may contain an adjuvant, depending on the year and the strain, to sort of boost the immune response that you would get to it. The live attenuated vaccine is available, um, and so uh, we'll talk about what that means. It's administered into the nose, and it's been designed so that it only is theoretically supposed to replicate at the temperature of your nose, and it should never actually make it down into the lungs and make you sick. That's the theory behind it. So live attenuated vaccine, because it's a live vaccine, has actually not been studied for solid organ transplant patients, and at this time it would be contraindicated. In BC, it's really only free for children 2 to 17 years of age. Um, it's not free for other age groups, but you should remind your patient that the inactivated influenza vaccine actually provides better coverage for adults or better protection. And because it's not free and because they're assault, if they're post-transplant, they should go for the inactive. So pre-transplant, they could get either, but when they're post-transplant, remind them to get the inactivated one. Uh, the question always comes up uh, about around vaccination and transplant. What are some of the harmful effects that could come from vaccines? So one that floated around in the early years was uh, rejection from the vaccine itself. So this was um, one of the studies uh, demonstrating that it's both efficacious and safe. They took 165 renal transplant recipients and vaccinated them with influenza vaccines. Some patients got one vaccine, some patients got two. Overall, what they found in the entire group was that seroprotection, so if you just measured their antibody response to the vaccine, was high, for anywhere somewhere around 80 to 90%. Um, Post-transplant, uh, the actual seroprotection did correlate with their MMF use or their mycophenolate use. In fact, patients on mycophenolate were up to five times less likely to respond. There was no benefit to a second vaccine, and out of those 165 patients, they didn't notice any rejection. If you read the literature for vaccination after transplant, you will often find a variety of seroprotection rates. The rates can vary from 15% to 93% even within the renal transplant population. Um, sometimes what happens is you have to look at these individual studies and decide when did they get the vaccine, how far were they from transplant, and how much immunosuppression. Overall, though, uh, a good response and well worth giving to patients. Uh, the graft rejection with, from the vaccine itself has never been found, and in fact, you're far more likely to get graft rejection with, the in, with natural influenza, and there's a lot more of that circulating, so patients should be vaccinated. Um, there has been some studies documenting an increase in allo antibody after influenza vaccine, so the rates are quoted anywhere from 5 to 17% in some of the literature. Uh, it may depend on the vaccine itself and or the adjuvant they use. So a lot of this literature comes from pandemic influenza vaccine, which actually also had an unusual adjuvant in it to increase the immune response. However, overall, what you should know is that these allo antibodies, even if they're detected, they're transient. They've often declined several months after vaccination to undetectable levels, and nobody's figured out whether or not they're clinically significant. So I think the bottom line is, for most vaccines, far better for your patient to get vaccinated. In terms of when to vaccinate, um, 
this I put here, but it applies to all the other vaccines that are inactivated that you could potentially give after transplant. So you may find yourself thinking you are at somewhat of a crossroads. Patients before transplant have end organ dysfunction and often don't respond to vaccines as well as they would as if they were healthy without end organ dysfunction. Patients after transplant are on immunosuppression, but they have better renal function often. So both run the risk of altered immune responses. Generally, the literature has shown that when you look at the seroprotection rates for vaccines, healthy patients have the highest response, dialysis patients have somewhat attenuated response, and post-transplant has the worst response. So if you're wondering, hey, should I wait till the patient's post-transplant, the answer is no. If you can give them any vaccine before transplant, uh, I would go for it. And in fact, not only is the seroprotection, your pre-transplant antibodies often predict what your post-transplant antibodies turn out to be. So um, if you can vaccinate them and get a high immune response prior to transplant, that's best because it will stay high after transplant. A couple of things to, to know about vaccines, even if you do give them uh, before transplant, uh, the solid organ transplant group has been documented to have antibodies that wane over time. So even if they were documented to be hep B immune pre-transplant, well, their immune response may wane till they're undetectable after transplant. Um, so there's not a whole lot of literature about what you're supposed to do with this, but certainly for vaccines like hep B, some people say you should be checking them on a yearly basis and boosting them if they've gone undetectable. So the second question that comes up is not only when do you vaccinate pre or post transplant, what's best, but also when can you start vaccinating again after transplant? So this really varies. There's um, a whole bunch of different recommendations depending on which guidelines you pull out. So the American Society for Transplantation says somewhere between three to six months. The IDSA says somewhere between two to six months. And for influenza though, they say you could vaccinate earlier if there was an influenza outbreak. And um, there's a third guideline out from the Kidney Foundation specifically saying about a month after transplant you can restart. So there's basically if it's an inactive vaccine, there is no harm to giving it to your patient early. It's the unfortunate part is your trade-off is that it's less immunogenic. So often this hand wavy three to six months is you're hoping that they get uh, to a point where their immunosuppression is minimal enough and they've healed enough that their immune response is the best it can be after transplant. So certainly if you're seeing someone early and they have a reason to need a vaccine, like they've cut themselves, they got dirt in it, you think they need a tetanus booster, then I would say go for it. It's just you shouldn't rely on that to be the best response. All right, the second vaccine that I'm gonna talk a little bit about is pneumococcal vaccine. So invasive pneumococcal disease is much more common in solid organ transplant patients. And what I mean by that is not just pneumococcal pneumonia. So the vaccine was actually designed, originally the pneumococcal vaccine, to protect against invasive pneumococcal disease, which is bacteremia, meningitis, anywhere that you can culture pneumococcus from a sterile site. So in the solid organ transplant group, it's documented that they get about 146 infections per 100,000 person years. And you may think, well, that doesn't mean very much to me. But that risk is actually 13 times the general population risk for pneumococcal disease. And the mortality from invasive pneumococcal disease is about 30%. If you include things like pneumococcal pneumonia, where you can, uh, which is a non-sterile site, the incidence rises to about five, 419 infections per 100,000 patient person years. So it's a very prevalent infection. There are two vaccines out there currently. Um, for anyone who has ch children in the audience, you'll recognize the second one. So there's the polysaccharide vaccine, or PPV23, and then there's a conjugate vaccine, PCV13. And essentially, the difference between the two of them is the following. The polysaccharide vaccine is a sugar. 
All it does is it stimulates your lymphocytes, your B cells, to produce those antibodies that we detect to figure out whether or not you're protected without T cell with help, so without other lymphocyte help. And that has implications for things like whether or not you have a memory response and whether or not you get a booster phenomenon. So a memory response are there's some cells of your immune system that hang around after you've cleared either a natural infection or a vaccine that the next time you encounter that organism, they're the ones that are gonna generate your primary response. Um, the booster phenomenon means the second time you're exposed, not only do you, does your response come faster, but your response is much higher or uh, much more aggressive than it was the first time. So if you do a conjugate vaccine, you add a diphtheria protein onto the, the pneumococcal vaccine, and your T cells are stimulated. So you get a memory B cell response, and then the next time they get the pneumococcal vaccine or they say see natural pneumococcal infection, they should get a more a higher response and a faster response to that infection or to the vaccine. So um, the reason there are two, the conjugate little kids don't respond to sugars. Their immune system hasn't developed enough. So this conjugate vaccine, the whole theory behind it was this is an infection that's very common in kids. You need the protein added to the vaccine to even let them respond in the first place. So the PCV13, the little kid vaccine, has now taken off um, in looking at using this because we think it gives a better immune response. People have wanted to use this for immune compromised groups. So there's been some studies done in HIV patients and stem cell patients where they've actually shown either improved efficacy, meaning the number of true invasive pneumococcal infections is lower in that group, or improved immunogenicity, meaning if you measure people to see what their antibody response is, more of them will have positive antibodies. There's not a lot of data in the SOT group. Basically, they have very similar seroprotection rates, meaning if you give a bunch of solid organ transplant patients the polysaccharide vaccine and a bunch of them the conjugate vaccine and you measure with the antibody response, you get about 80% in both groups. Um, and it lasts for about the same amount of time. And so, and there haven't been any studies to actually show it decreases what we really care about, which is the number of pneumo invasive pneumococcal infections. So currently the Canadian guidelines grade the evidence as fair. However, most guidelines that are driven either by the AST or by IDSA or by even the US um, vaccine equivalent of the Canadian Committee have recommended that for any immunocompromised group, including pre-transplant patients, that really PCV13 should be used. So currently in BC, PCV13 is only covered for stem cell and HIV. We've actually asked the BC CDC to review this and add it as a new vaccine for all SOT candidates pre and post. Uh, so we'll see if they, they go for that. If it's given, um, it comes in an unusual sort of regimen. If you give the conjugate vaccine first, you can give the polysaccharide vaccine eight weeks later. If they get PV23, you can only give the conjugate vaccine a year later. And you may be thinking, well, why is that? Well, PPV23, the polysaccharide vaccine, not only does it not give you memory cells, not only does it not give you this booster phenomenon of a higher response the second time, but it actually, if you try to give people PPV2 frequently, their response diminishes over time. They become less responsive to the thing you were trying to vaccinate them against. So the reason I mention this is that really people should only be getting booster doses every five years, and if you're th giving people them more frequently, you actually may do be doing your patient a disservice. All right, so the third vaccine I thought I'd talk about is um, varicella, and it's mainly because I want to talk a little bit about zoster vaccine. I get a lot of questions about that. So. Varicella, just primary and, uh, com and complications as a result of varicella has a higher incidence. Again, SOT, this is the theme of the day. So about 27 to 55 cases per 1,000 patient years. So you can see much smaller number versus 1.5 to 3 in the general patient population. 
causes a lot more morbidity, but also some mortality. So it, patients are more likely to have multidermatomal zoster if they get ver if they get shingles. They're much more likely to have disseminated disease, up to 40%, and up to a third of patients can die in some series, depending on whether you're looking at primary or just zoster. It also has been associated with graft rejection, which is often another theme that goes with infection. So the varicella vaccine has been available in BC since about 1990. It's a live attenuated vaccine uh, with a strain of varicella. In uh, BC, two doses are available for seronegative patients if they're not immunocompromised, and you have to separate them by six weeks because once you have a viral infection, your, act, your immune system is a little bit lower for the next little while. That's why you can't vaccinate them again right away. You, will get a, you won't get a response if you give them any closer together. So it is worth checking because there are patients, particularly from the temperate or from the tropical areas of the world, if they grew up there, who have never seen varicella. And um, because it's a live viral vaccine pre-transplant, it's acceptable if they're on minimal immunosuppression, meaning if they have a disorder that causes their, their end-stage renal disease, which requires them to be on MMF or corticosteroids, well, then varicella vaccine may be out. But if they're on minimal immunosuppression, they may still be able to get it. And then they have to be able to wait four weeks afterwards before they can be uh, go on to transplant because it's a live viral vaccine that actually replicates within the body in order to induce an immune response. So post-transplant is generally contraindicated. Um, and I say generally, I would think for most of you guys, the answer is no, you can't give it. There are a small number of studies, this is a huge issue in pediatrics, especially if they get their kidney transplant early, where um, patients who have been stable for a number of years on very minimal immunosuppression have gotten varicella vaccine within a study setting. The seroconversion rates have been 70 to 80 percent, so fairly good, and patients in the studies did well under study conditions. It's not really ready for prime time, but um, I, I would add that if your patient has a failing graft and goes back onto dialysis and gets down on minimal immunosuppression and you're thinking about retransplant, that's also another good opportunity. So there are some times when you may want to think about this. If your patient's not immune, then every time they're exposed to varicella, they have to get post-exposure prophylaxis. So post-exposure prophylaxis is this thing called Verzig. It's just an immunoglobulin preparation that's been concentrated to have extra varicella antibody in it. You can give it with or without acyclovir or Valtrex to patients. However, uh, the reason vaccines are so important, it may not be fully protective. So there are some series of pediatric patients where um, eight pediatric patients ended up with primary disease after transplant, and they had two deaths in that series. And one patient had actually received Verzig within hours of the exposure, and he still died. So uh, it's not as good as your own immunity. All right, so now I'm going to move on to shingles vaccine or Zostavax, which is what I get more questions about. And so I'm just going to remind people that uh, vaccine efficacy isn't just the antibodies. So I've said that a few times. What you really want is to show it actually reduces disease. Sometimes we measure antibodies even though we know it doesn't correlate with protection in some instances. Antibodies are very cheap and easy to measure. You can do it in a lab. Um, but they, they aren't always the immune response you want. So shingles is a good example. What pr predicts whether or not someone's going to get shingles is not their antibodies. So if someone can have a positive antibody to varicella and still be at risk of shingles, it's actually your T cells, your cell-mediated immunity, which, which keeps the latent virus under control. So even if someone has a detectable varicella antibody pre-transplant, they still may want to think about shingles vaccine. So Zostavax um, was basically developed because there was an outbreak of shingles once they introduced varicella vaccine. I don't know if you realize this. So what used to happen is 
Everyone who was an adult who had had chicken pox as a child walked around and got exposed to all these kids who were still getting chicken pox, and they had their own immunity boosted naturally. And then we started giving kids all these varicella vaccines, and there was no more chicken pox in the community, and so nobody got boosting of their immune system naturally, and shingles became much more of a problem. So we, they took the varicella vaccine, and what they did is they took 14 times the concentration of that same strain and formulated it together and called it Zostavax. So that's what, actually what Zoster vaccine is. So if someone has never seen varicella, I would say start with varicella vaccine. Do not start with Zostavax. You're giving them a lot more live virus. It's licensed to, uh, for individuals who are healthy who are over the age of 15. In BC, it's recommended to those groups, but it's not provided free to. Um, so the cost can be anywhere, I've seen 160 to $200, depending on which pharmacy you get it from. Pre-transplanted is acceptable if they're on minimal immunosuppression again. And again, because it's a live viral vaccine, they have to be able to not go to transplant in the next four weeks. Um, so for the same reason, oh, I went the wrong way. Post-transplant is generally contraindicated, I would say likely forever going to be contraindicated. And the reason I say likely forever is because there are some new vaccines coming for shingles, which are actually inactive vaccines that look a lot more promising. So um, there's one going through right now that in healthy adults had uh, great protection against shingles and it was an inactive vaccine. And I think those vaccines are now being tested in immunocompromised groups like the HIV cohorts with also promising results. So I imagine soon we won't even have to talk about shingles vaccine being a live viral vaccine. The other question I get uh, when it comes to live vaccines is household contacts. So not just, my, I'm post-transplant, I know I can't get it, but what about my kids or my spouse? So contacts, household contacts should receive all the routine vaccines including all the live vaccines. So they're allowed to get live vaccines as long as they themselves are not immunocompromised. The only exception is oral polio va vaccine. And the only reason I mention that is because although we don't use oral polio vaccine in North America anywhere, some of the patients that I know you see have come from developing areas of the world and there still are regions of the world where oral polio vaccine is used. And oral polio, polio vaccine has been shown to spread to contacts. In fact, that's the whole beauty of oral polio vaccine is you vaccinate one person, they shed it in their stools like mad, and then everyone else around them gets vaccine, vaccinated. So in a developing setting, it's a very cheap way to vaccinate a large number of people. So if somebody's traveling to an area of the world, they shouldn't be in a household with someone who's gotten oral polio vaccine. For all live viral vaccines of, uh, in contacts, the shedding sometimes can be in, inverse to age. So for example, for the live attenuated influenza vaccine, uh, kids who were 18, eight to 36 months old had about an 80% shedding rate versus only 30% if they were five to 49 years old. And also you're much more likely to be in contact with secretions of someone who is that young as well. So there may be also increased exposure with that. Uh, the maximum shedding usually occurs sort of within the first few days of vaccine, vaccination. And the only exception may be um, if you have a transplant patient who has a very small child, uh, rotavirus is a live viral vaccine and it will be shed in the stool for about four weeks. So that's something they need to know about. So the reason live viral vaccines are not contraindicated for most house, for household contacts outside of polio is that actual transmission rates have been very rare and there's typically no sequela given the fact it's an attenuated virus. Um, there are some tips, there are a few things that people should know. So for mothers of transplant recipients, so if they have a very young child who gets a transplant at a young age, they should avoid nursing after they've had a live viral vaccine for a few days or maybe put off the, the vaccine until they're not nursing anymore. Um, and then for rotavirus, because I mentioned it sheds for about four weeks if they can avoid doing diaper duty during that time. 
And then finally, for the shingles vaccine specifically, one of the reactions can be that patients sometimes get uh, small varicella-like lesions around the site of where they were vaccinated. If that occurs, then the household contact should cover it up and not let the, anyone else touch it because that fluid is infectious. All right, so the final main vaccine that I was gonna talk about is measles, because um, I started with the case. So I, measles may be uncommon in Canada, but it unfortunately is common in many other places in the world. There are still 20 million cases every year worldwide. We've had outbreaks here locally. So Vancouver in 2010 with the Winter Olympics, we got a little, vac a little measles to go with it. Uh, we also had an outbreak in the Fraser Valley in 2014. Uh, it has very high morbidity and mortality in actually all patients. You don't need to be a transplant patient to experience sequela. So pneumonia occurs in 1 in 20 people who get measles. Encephalitis occurs in 1 in 1,000. And this um, sclerosing panencephalitis that is a late complication of measles occurs in about 4 to 11 of a million and death occurs in one to two out of every thousand. So this is why this vaccine was developed, because this is a viral infection nobody wants. Uh, in transplant patients who have gotten it, it's also been, again, associated with rejection. In addition, not only is it a deadly virus, we don't have any specific treatment available for it. So usually you can give supportive care, um, there is some evidence to give vitamin A just to improve outcomes. People have tried ribavirin uh, off-label. Uh, they're not very effective, and patients usually just have to wait till they either recover on their own. If someone was exposed to measles, we also don't have great post-exposure prophylaxis. So for varicella, at least, we have Verzig. For measles, all we have is well, if you're healthy, you can get an MMR vaccine within 72 hours, and that actually is protective against you developing measles. But all we can offer you is just bland old IVIG if MMR is contraindicated. So really the best protection for this is immunization. The measles is a live attenuated uh, vaccine with a strain that's been available since about the 1960s. So depending on the age of the patient you're seeing, they may have had natural measles infection if they were born before 1970. They may have gotten one vaccine if they were around from 1970 to 1990. And then after 1990, they noticed breakthroughs in people who only had one measles vaccine. So now they actually recommend two measles vaccine. So measles immunity is uh, either one of the following, born before 1970, as I mentioned, documentation of one or two vaccines, or the lab confirmed immunity by the antibody level. If you're high risk, meaning if you are going to go to transplant, you should either have both vaccines well documented or preferably that you have lab confirmed immunity with an antibody response before you go to transplant. In BC, you can get two doses if you're not immunocompromised. And as I've already mentioned, if you're seeing younger patients, they may need the second dose. Um, again, like an, all other live viral vaccines, you can't boost them right away. You have to separate the second dose by about four weeks. And so pre-transplant, you can give it if the patient's on minimal immunosuppression. However, they have to be on hold for at least four weeks before they go to transplant. And post-transplant is generally contraindicated. Um, there have been four studies of this in pediatric solid organ transplant patients with high, uh, 40 to 100 percent seroconversion. So, yeah, you can pick where you want to be. It's really not recommended in the post-transplant setting, except again, I put this up to remind everyone: if your patient has their graft fail and they're on minimal immunosuppression, then maybe it's a time to boost them if they were gonna go for transplant again. The other routine vaccines that I've mentioned, pertussis, it's inactivated, so you could get it per your post. There have been multiple pertussis outbreaks in the States and even in Vancouver um, within the last few years, so if you can update their tetanus uh, and give them a little pertussis booster pre-transplant, and then every 10 years they should be going for regular vaccination. And hepatitis B should be given to all patients. So they should be getting it on dialysis anyway uh, at 
with the dialysis dosing, so twice the, the normal dose. Um, and the reason would be exposure to blood, either through dialysis, transplant, or receiving blood products. And some transplant donors are Hep B core antibody positive, and the best protection is if you stick that. The risk of transmission from that is low, but the risk is virtually zero if you stick it into someone who's immune to hepatitis B. Seroconversion rates really vary anywhere from 20 to 70 percent, de uh, even within both the pre and the post transplant. So you may want to keep checking them. And if they were uh, vaccinated before, they may need to be boosted as their antibody wanes. Hepatitis A is another inactive vaccine. It's recommended for high risk patients. So for renal transplant patients, unfortunately, it's not routine. But if they are um, MSM or they have liver disease, then they can receive it for free in BC. Uh, Hep A vaccine is well documented that if you wanted to give it to someone who wanted to travel after transplant to an endemic region, well, the, the immunity wanes much faster than normal hosts. So essentially, if you, if you check someone who is otherwise healthy, you gave them one dose of hepatitis A vaccine, virtually 100% of them are still seroprotected two years later, whereas only about 60% of transplant patients are, and that wanes over time to virtually near zero. The seroconversion rate, unfortunately, if your transplant patient needs this after transplant because they're going to travel somewhere, are only around 25%, and that can go up to 60 to 70% if you, you give them booster doses, but that's in a few series. So overall, the rates are all over. If your patient wants to travel to an endemic area and they haven't been vaccinated and they need to go right away or they've already been documented to not respond to the hepatitis A vaccine, unfortunately that means that they need to get immunoglobulin uh, intramuscularly before they go. That will provide them protection against hepatitis A for about three months of travel. And then for one other vaccine I did want to mention is um, particularly because sometimes you get young transplant patients or for anyone here who's pediatric, um, HPV. So there's many subtypes of HPV which causes the common wart to cervical cancer. So HPV strains 16 to 18 are the ones that are associated with cancer versus 6 and 11 which cause about 90% of warts. Um, this causes a lot of morbidity in transplant patients, so not a lot of mortality. Um, they have about 14 to 100 times the risk of uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or anal intraepithelial ne neoplasia, which are the precursors to cervical and anal cancer, respectively. Post-transplant patients also have an increased skin cancer risk, and often uh, squamous cell cancer can be increased if they have HPV infection. And they also are at increased risk of just getting warts um, from the immunosuppression. So there are two vaccines available, a bivalent one with two of the strains, so 16 and 18, and then the quadrivalent has all four listed up there. They are inactivated. Um, in BC, it's available to anyone for free born who's born after 1994 on a two-dose schedule. And as of September 1st, high-risk males are also covered now in BC at the same, in the same age group. Other eligible populations can receive it, they just have to pay for it. So any women under the age of 45 years old, um, non-high-risk males who are 9 to 26 years old, or any MSM who's older than 27 years of age can also receive this vaccine. Um, if they're prescribed it, they just have to be able to afford it. It's, a, it's the same cost as the, as the Zostervax, about 175 per, per dose. So pre-transplant, if they're a candidate, you can give the series. And post-transplant, you can give it if they're still eligible. There are a small number of studies showing that the immunogenicity rates, the antibody rates that are lower than what you get with the non-immunocompromised group, and anywhere from 50 to 60% protection. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about travel vaccines. So I've mentioned travel once with hepatitis A, 
but there are a whole host of other unusual vaccines that you might want to consider depending on where your patient wants to go after they've been transplanted. So travel vaccines, there are a number. Most of them have not specifically been tested in the solid organ transplant population. So the actual protection it may provide may be uncertain. If it's an inactivated product, you can give it. It's okay to give. If the live products to really avoid are the following, yellow fever, the oral polio vaccine, oral typhoid vaccine, and BCG. That means if your patient's gonna travel somewhere, this is the list of vaccines they can consider. So rabies vaccine, um, inactivated polio vaccine, inactivated typhoid vaccine, Ducoral, so if they're gonna travel, this one is often not in the guidelines because it's not available in the US and many of the guidelines come out of the US. So uh, Ducoral is okay. Meningococcal vaccine and Japanese encephalitis vaccine. So all of those would be acceptable. So in summary, um, I've talked about a number of vaccines uh, and I've put up a sort of summary slide of which ones are acceptable. So pre-transplant, everyone that I talked about is acceptable, barring that they're not on major immunosuppression. And then post-transplant, the live vaccines are the ones to avoid varicella, MMR, yellow fever, and others. So my final tips are to think about vaccination before your patient goes to transplant. Check their serology, encourage patients to go get their updates. Vaccinate them as early as you can. If you're thinking maybe this will be a potential renal transplant candidate or you just want to provide overall good general care, recommend someone go for vaccination and to update. And then you can repeat serology and boost for things like hepatitis B if needed. And then I have one last thing to say about this slide because um, I, I really like this graph. But what I will say is that you may have noticed I use this slide to talk about vaccination as one of the 10 most important public health things in the last, over the last century. But realistically, it, uh, death was already on the decline long before then. And actually, one of the biggest things was chlorination was introduced into public water, into the water in the United States. So I remind everyone to wash your hands frequently. It's probably the best thing you can do. <laughs> So hopefully I've managed to cover the objectives that I set out, and then I'd be happy to take any questions if someone has questions. Questions, please go ahead. <laughs> So that's a huge issue in pediatrics. Are you in pediatrics? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it actually, those visits there from the pediatrics group take a long time. You often have to spend um, time to address what each of the issues are or to correct each of the misinformation. Um, and then uh, all I can suggest is to keep reoffering it at subsequent follow-up because or to see sometimes they can, they've been able to negotiate alternate strategies or things to address some of their concerns. Although that doesn't stop them from not getting their flu vaccine on a yearly basis. And I run into that all the time. Patients who think they got the flu from the flu vaccine and who don't want it again. Any other questions at all? Maybe I'll ask one then in the meantime. Um, I guess you, the CM, CMV is something we deal with a lot. And uh, so cytomegalovirus, obviously a common post-transplant complication. There is a vaccine in development and they're in trials right now. Just your comments on where that's at, what do you think? Is it gonna work? 
I think that they've tried this several times and it has not been very effective, unfortunately, to develop a vaccine that works. I, I actually don't think at this time that it's a promising strategy, although hopefully maybe someone will prove me wrong because it would be nice uh, to have a vaccine against CMV. We don't know yet. It's supposed to cause shingles at a lot, much less rate, but nobody really knows. But the, in the whole intention of the shingles vaccine was to sort of wait uh, until all these children grew up and then hopefully their incidence would be lower. You brought up, uh, a, a, you mentioned the issue of the failing transplant patient. I just wanted to probe that a little bit further. So, you know, so there's, all, there's obviously variability in terms of what we do with immunosuppression in patients who are, who've had a failed graft. And so there's no data on this. I want your opinion really in terms of what you think. So in patients who are on low doses of immunosuppression, on a maintenance level, a bit of prednisone and kind of low dose. What's your what's what's the current state of affairs in terms of vaccination? So I'm guessing the live virus live vaccines are still uh, not considered in that scenario. Or uh, no, we have done it for a few patients for things for that cause, yeah though, for yeah. yeah. Um, no, not even for cause for for patients who are on like five of prednisone and, and nothing else. Definitely, we have done measles or MMR. And um, I do think that's an opportunity to relook at vaccination for patients who are, have made it down to very low levels, because often um, they can be done safely. Okay. Great. Ruth, and then we'll have Janice. Ruth, go ahead. I think the major one is sort of the hep B, just because there's often an ongoing risk of exposure to blood products for these patients and the potential they may return to dialysis. Um, the only recommendation as I've ever seen is a yearly basis, which I think is a reasonable time period. Again, and moving forward, yeah. Yes. That's the under the magic cutoff and boosting. Yeah. So, um, and this isn't well demonstrated and it may be because in healthy patients it doesn't really matter. So when hep B vaccine was first developed, it was tested up north because there was a, a lot more hep B outbreaks out going and, and in the First Nations up there they could, they could follow it. And what they found was if they gave normal immune status patients, the hep B vaccine, it actually didn't matter whether they seroconverted or not, because even if they didn't seroconvert, a lot of them later on went on to demonstrate that they had seen hep B, meaning they developed a core antibody to, against hep B that was positive, but they never clinically had hepatitis and they never had any issues from it. However, in the immunocompromised patient population, all we know is that the antibody is low. And we don't know what that means for the other arms of the immune res response. We're not checking sort of cellular immunity to see if they still are going to mount a response, even if they don't have an antibody level. And so therefore, if someone is going to be at risk and is going to be exposed to blood products, then they really should have an antibody level that's over 10 in order to be protected. And if they are under that and they are going to be at ongoing risk, then you should revaccinate them to boost their immune response. Great. So there's no other questions. I'll thank Alyssa for a great talk. We actually wanted to get Donald Trump to do this talk, but given his expertise in, in vaccinations, <laughs> but 
We couldn't get a hold of him. He's preoccupied. So thank you, Eliza, for stepping in.